Thank you. So there are two more questions, possibly a third if we have time. Uh, so we have two more questions, and possibly a third, depending upon whether you wish to take the floor. Oh, I'm free. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> the next question is Mr. Raju Vs. Please do. Mr. Raju Dutt? Did you say Raju Dutt? No. No. My name is Raju Vyas. Raju Vyas. Yes, please. I'm a freelance journalist, Azur. Yes, I know. Vyas is a Sri Lankan name. I've been there many no, times. No, Vyas are uh, Hindu. No? The great Vyas, V-Y-A-S. I see. Right. <laughs> I'm Hindu by religion. I've uh, you, sir, You're not, not Tamil. I beg your pardon? You're not Tamil. No, I'm oh. Gujarati Hindu from That's India. Right. Right. So. You, sir, are heading a very difficult task in my view, in a very pressed time, you are swimming against the tide. How do you get the strength? How do you preach the strength? Do you have any fear? And how do you give strength to your followers from the other Muslims who do not accept you, sir? Thank you. Well, swimming against time is the most important part of your question. But those who swim against the tides, they always change the tides if they're right. So gradually, the swimming becomes less arduous and uh, easier as you proceed because the times change along with you. All the prophets of God who founded a religion, all the law-bearing, not only law-bearing, but founders of religions, started swimming against the time single-handed, alone by themselves. And what happened? The tides were changed. And it is that history from which we draw our strength. You said strength, where you get the strength? Strength can only be drawn from faith. Faith born on the hard facts of history or hard facts of nature. The rest of the faiths are just faiths and no more. They can't even change the li lives of those who hold those faiths. And this is the dilemma of the present world. So this is how you can recognize Ahmadiyyat as standing out differently from the community of other religions. Otherwise, just we are one of so many. Why should you be interested in us, not in others? And this is the demar line of demarcation which you have suggested to me that we are strong in faith, so much so strong that we can adhere to faith, the faith so faithfully, despite the fact that we have to offer sacrifices of our lives, of our properties, of our honor, continuously over a large number of years. Consistently we have been doing it. So that is an indication that we do have faith. And the faith, faith must be founded on something. It has to be truth. Otherwise, the faith which are founded on fantasies can work for a while, you know. They, they create a stir. But that is only an infatuation, it's not love. It doesn't last. Faith, the true faith, is the lasting motive force which drives humans to an end to with a purpose. So the last 100 years of Ahmadiyyat has proved it already that we have stood the tests of times. In Pakistan, you know it is uh, punishable by death to declare La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Did you know that? To claim that Allah is one and Muhammad is his prophet and servant. If an Ahmadi makes this claim, it is punishable by death under 295C, which would not permit even for such a criminal to be bailed out. Because this is the crime of the gravest nature according to the law of Pakistan now, fully supported by the Supreme Court's decisions. Now, something is happening which is so strange. Something is happening which never happened before in the history of human persecution, religious or otherwise. Now, you find persecution everywhere in the world. 
Why? Because some people dare to disagree with you. Not because they dare to agree with you. <laughs> so here is something new added to the history of human persecution. Of course you hear of so much persecution in Russia, persecution of those who would disagree with communist philosophy. Right. But I never read Stalin punishing or anybody else torturing somebody for the fact that he fully agreed and endorsed the views of communism. The same is depicted by the history of Christianity during the dark, 300 years before Dark Ages, when in uh, many countries of Europe, Christians were persecuted for holding different views from Christianity as was understood by the dominant society. But never before you would find an example of a people gone so mad, so stark mad, as to punish others for agreement. But there has to be some reason. After all, other things of life, they are not bad. And when you understand the reason, there, at the same moment, you understand the truth of Ahmadiyya community. They tried their best to stem the tide. They took all possible measures to stop the passage of Ahmadiyya and failed. So now they say that is the only way out. Punish them for agreeing with the fundamentals of Islam so that if they deviate, then the Muslims will stop following them. If they do not, then they lose their lives. Now this is the dastardly plan which ultimately has been uh, put into action through legal help, through legislation. Because it's a, the ultimate of acceptance of defeat. And the earth has to be so true, so strong, so powerful, that still it continues to flourish in Pakistan. Not a day has dawned since, not a sun has set on Pakistan when Ahmadiyya did not flourish on and on and on, pro you know, progressed from strength to strength. So this is exactly what happened in the early periods of Christianity. And that is what we present to, to the Christians as a proof of Jesus reborn. Not in person, but in spirit, in character. Because this is the essence of Christianity. If somebody slaps you on one cheek, offer the other one. And this, according to Jesus Christ, was far more powerful instrument of, 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 of battle with the uh, falsehood than raising sword against sword. And we have proved it. In Pakistan, I do not permit Ahmadis to retaliate because the founder of the Ahmadiyya community did not permit us to retaliate with the same coins. So what we are doing is patience and patience and tell, tell them to all right, Beat the life out of us, if you may, if you can. <laughs> but you can't beat the faith out of us, with the grace of Allah. Thank you. So the penultimate question. This is the last, last and... Last but one. If, yes. If uh, okay, well, I'll be short, a brief next time, inshallah. Mr. Because Brian. some of the guests may have been tired, you know, sitting for long. Please. Exactly. Mr. Brian Rogers of Birmingham, please. Please. <laughs> <coughs> Good evening, Nazul. How do you do? Good well, thank you. Yes. Uh, my question uh, refers to technology of the day. With the advancement of technology, for example, carbon dating, ground x-rays, DNA <coughs> and the like, how far along the technology road do we go for fear of exposing some of the legends and stories that may affect our re religious beliefs as ignorance is sometimes bliss. Well, what is technology? Technology is the understanding of the creative plan of God and to follow it as much as you can. 
and you can never become creative unless you run along the direction of God's creation. This is the basic philosophy of science. So there cannot be anything wrong whatsoever in imitating God in His creation, provided that it is carried out for good purposes. If it is done to frustrate the spiritual plan of God, that would be putting His creation against His world. Then, of course, it will not be permitted. Otherwise, this technology is most welcome. And Ahmadis pay very great stress on education and women in particular, because they have been withheld from getting higher education by some of the orthodox mullahs, unfortunately against the teachings of Islam. But our standard of education in, of, in women, or at least literacy, is so high that Rabwa is the one town in Pakistan where Ahmadi women are 100% literate while the rate of literacy in the country for women would be less than 8%. And we go for education all over the world, and we uh, try to create atmosphere which would be promotive for higher education for our children. We tell them to abstain from vain luxuries of the world. They don't drink, they don't go to the pubs or dancing floors, and they don't chase skirts. I hope so. In some cases I know, you know, some odd man here and there would do. Nobody can guarantee anything about the youth. So I don't want to make any false statements, false impression on you. Some MD youths I know deviate, but comparatively much less. My a yes, please. I, I was referring mainly to the side of Turin and and the after effects of the um, um, exposure to it being fake. To that white? Was, well, was I the, couldn't follow the question, please. Would you help me? About the Turin shot. Huh? Turin shot. In the beginning, I thought that. Yeah, but then the when you started talking of technology... The I technology thought, was referring course, to the carbon dating and the technology that allows I people agree. to expose sorry things for, that we believe. And sorry for Turing. going following a completely different yes. avenue from what which was intended by you for yes. me to follow. Now, on Turin Shroud, there is a version of Catholic Church in particular who appointed or permitted certain top scientists to work on Turin Shroud, and they published their uh, findings, which were contrary to the beliefs earlier held about the Turin Shroud. Many and other, many and other scientists stood up against this. <coughs> And they have written books on this. I have got those books with me. I have read them. And they proved positively that it was a conspiracy against truth. Because if the finding of the Turin Shroud is accepted to be totally true, then there is no room for Trinity left in Christianity. Then the truth of Jesus Christ can only be understood in his being a messenger of God then there is no truth left in his revival from the dead. Because the person who was wrapped in the Turin Shroud was living and breathing and bleeding. And a dead man could not do that. So the evidence of breath with ammonia, with, with carbon dioxide, and evidence of blood smudging the cloth all around, is a definite testimony that the man who was wrapped in this shroud was still alive and breathing. You see, I, I have to explain this last bit because many people may not be uh, familiar with this issue. If a man dies in this position standing upright, then the blood from his wounds must flow downwards. 
the blood from his wounds cannot make a smudge, a round smudge around the center of the prick. It can only happen when such a man is wrapped while lying prone and continues to bleed. And that is the story of the two inch shroud which uh, hurts so many and makes them make so many so worried. So the other scientists, again Christians, all of them, they protest against this sort of investigation and also they prove that the carbon dating is not as defined and as precise as you let the world understand. They have proved from scientific inquiry that carbon dating could be off the mark by a thousand years. So for them to say that Turin Shroud could not be traced back beyond 1200 years because of carbon dating is invalid anyway. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't prove anything. Moreover, the presence of the pollen, grass pollen, on the Turin Shroud, which is found in abundance in Palestine and not elsewhere in the world, was pointed out by these scientists. They said, but how do you read that? And how would you explain the fact that this style of weaving was popular in that 100 year in which Jesus came and went? It was not in existence before, was not continued after him. So they pointed many fingers at the fact of crucifixion and the circumstances in which it took place and the facts relating to Jesus Christ and the times of Jesus Christ. But above, over and above this, there is one point which is completely baffling for those scientists who would like us to draw different conclusions. The fact that if it was a fake, then the fake must have been done by a foul person who was attributing a fake thing to Jesus Christ and earning some worldly gains out of that. He had to be an artist of some type, but how on earth could he fake an image which was negative? Completely negative image. I have never read a scientist answer this question, except those who agree with the, the genuineness of Turin Shroud. They say yes, and they have attempted to show and prove that through natural means, camera-like effect could be produced, and they have demonstrated it. Particularly, they draw our attention to the fact that the 12 ingredients of the ointment which was uh, rubbed over the body, injured body of Jesus Christ, contained such elements as when applied to a plate of glass even today and exposed to, to any image through a, 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 a pinhole, for instance. The image which would, be, which would be created on this glass would be a negative image. So under what circumstances that makeshift camera was, uh, 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 was invented by God or organized by God, they suggest, for instance, the fact, first of all, the ointment had some photosynthetic material. Second, the fact that the reserves uh, in, the, in the terrain there, underground minerals, were rich in two things in particular, sulfur and ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate has been exported from Palestine for so many years until artificial manure was uh, synthesized. That was the main source of this manure because the area below is rich in that. And when these they decompose, they create create ammonia and uh, sulfur fumes also play a role. So the scenario they have built 
is that when Jesus was kept in the sepulchre, a stone was placed over it and there was darkness. So he perspired there because when you apply ointments to the wounds, naturally you also perspire. So the urea which the, was excreted from the perspiration also played a vital role in making the whole material photosynthetic. Then we read in the New Testament and from other accounts that due to earthquake quake shocks, the stone was removed to a degree, not entirely, from the opening of the cave. And then after a while, it came back and fitted on that. Sunlight must have entered then. There was no need for a, uh, for a pinhole or lens camera because the material of the cloth was sticking next to his body. So any light penetrating from outside into that material must have created a negative image. How to fix it? This is the question. Because there has to be a fixer for uh, uh, guaranteeing that further light and further exposure would not destroy the image created under, under circumstances. So they have proved, the scientists demonstrated that if sulfur fumes appear afterwards, they would stabilize the compound into a non-photosynthetic compound. And the evidence is abundant that during the earthquake, sulfur fumes also were emitted by the, by the earth. So they say this is the nearest to what we can believe, scientifically. Whatever other position you take, it is absolutely unjustifiable, because then you have to involve a fake artist, born hundreds of years before camera was invented. And they say, even now, when the camera is invented, no living artist can make a negative image of a person sitting before him. It's impossible. Very minute shades and changes, subtle changes in the negative image defy an artist to produce negatives out of a sitting person before them. So they say, this is a certainty. It was not a fake. If you ask how it could have happened, we suggest this. If you find some fault with the suggestion, find a better reason. But you can't deny the fact that it was a genuine cloth wrapped around Jesus Christ. There are still marks of lashing on that cloth. There are still marks of pricks of thorns around his head. So they say, how can you ignore these additive, additional factors? This a, a complete evidence, full evidence, admissible in any court, that he had to be Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. The last question? The last question is, yes, okay. Mr. John Moore, please. Your Holiness, uh, my name is John Moore. I'm engaged in private Catholic evangelization. The um, question is brief, really. Uh, as Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? Now, um, last year, I had the privilege of going with a Muslim man in to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And in there, immediately inside the door, is uh, the place where when Jesus was taken down from the cross, he was laid on the floor and he was covered with a, uh, with a cloth. However, I'm not, that's not my question, but I, as you've uh, yeah, I talked on it. And my question is, uh, Jesus did say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to me, nobody can come to the Father except through me. Any comment, please? Um. 
Do you belong to Seventh Day Adventists? No. No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> because this also is a, is something on which they emphasize. You know. That's right. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I have already answered this question in answer to the question raised by our Hindu friend here, when he spoke of Krishna having made the same claim, much before Jesus Christ, mind you. And I have read the fundamental books of all major religions, not all, but all major religions, and I find a reference to exactly the same in so many uh, statements of either the prophets or the divine scriptures. The Holy Prophet has made exactly the same claim. So it is a time-related claim, you must remember. It has to be made by every prophet. Because if a prophet says, I am not the way, then he is denying himself. He is rejecting the necessity of people finding God through him. So in Islamic terminology, in the Holy Quran, Hazrat Muhammad is mentioned as wasila, the doorway to God. So I have read that so many times. I, I love reading Bible as well. But because I have read other religions, so I can immediately find similarities between the style of expression. So this only means that in relation to God, a prophet becomes himself an eternal truth. Because if he speaks the language of God and God alone, then he becomes eternal, not in person, not in relation to his human form, but in relation to his views and ideas and ideologies. So if you belong to eternal God, you must have some features of eternal God or aspects of his character transferred to you. Or your claim that you, have, you are in communion with him or you belong to him would be falsified if you can't show any signs. So these are the fundamental signs which are shown by all major prophets of the world. That we have become identified with an eternal super being. And in us you find this Alpha and Omega and, and, and the door. So I, I hope that should be sufficient for you to understand our viewpoint on this issue. Thank you. Zurat, that actually ends the questions, but uh, there is a gentleman, a friend of the community, who would like to say a few words of thanks. Mm, most you, welcome. His name is if Mr. They're not, if they're not embarrassing to me, I mean. <laughs> I'm sure. I know some of people out of their kindness, it happened there in London, for instance, they start speaking highly of me and I am such a humble man, you know. I was perspiring from head to foot by the time he finished. <laughs> Please. Mr. Neville Stack would like to say Please a few words. Your Holiness, uh, the words will be few and you will not perspire. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank I've, you. I've, I've been asked um, and, and I'm delighted to accept um, the honour of thanking you so on behalf of all the people here who have come to be so enlightened by your depth of knowledge, your breadth of knowledge, not only of your own religion but of others which I think will be enlightening also to the people who are not members of your faith. Um, your deep knowledge and the breadth of your vision and the forward-looking um, faith in technology <laughs> as, a, as a spiritual weapon is, not, is touching to everybody who, who is um, looking to the future so eagerly with, um, with sub apprehension. Um, may I thank you also for the extremely good humour which, uh, to which you tolerated our naivety <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and to say how on behalf of everybody here how very much obliged we are to you for finding the time in your worldwide travels to come to this outpost of your empire. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I agree that I'm not perspiring from head to foot but still I have to use my handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> with so much gratitude to you for your kindness and generosity. Allah bless you all.
It has been a very wonderful evening I have spent with you. Thank you for sharing your time and coming here and uh, providing this opportunity of get together and free exchange of views like gentlemen. Thank you. And ladies, of course. <laughs> when we say gentlemen, you know, we also, also include ladies because this is the customary expression we have inherited from ages. So with due apologies to the feminists, I will still say gentlemen, in my opinion, includes all ladies. Allah bless you. Thank you.